Go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. It's page 924 if you're using one of the black chair Bibles, 924. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, we are continuing our study of the book of Colossians, a a study that will draw our attention to the sufficiency of Christ, that's the goal that our eyes would be fixed and our, our minds would be set to understand that Christ is sufficient for every aspect of life and death. No matter what comes our way now or in the life after, that Christ is sufficient. He is our hope of glory. That's the, the theme of our study, Christ the hope of glory. He is our hope of glory In other words, He is the confidence that we will, if we are in Him, enjoy the reward of eternal life that was purchased by Him for us. That's what hope is. Hope is the confident assurance that if I am in Christ, that I will enjoy the eternal reward that He purchased for me. The Colossian Christians were facing some outside voices that were claiming that there was more needed, that just that Christ alone was not enough. Salvation by grace through faith was not enough. Some were articulating the idea that you needed to gain more knowledge, that you needed to cut off the material world, that somehow separating the physical from the spiritual. Some were articulating and arguing that you had to add more religious practice to your life, that you needed to keep the feasts of the Old Testament, even to the point of bringing back the sacrificial system. The goal of Paul in writing to them is to encourage them to stay the course. Don't be drawn away from the gospel. So Paul starts his letter with an expression of thanksgiving noting that he thanks God regularly for their faith, a faith that is demonstrated by their love for one another and a love that is grounded in a hope of Christ. His opening words are a call to the gospel. It is as though he wants to be certain that they understand what the gospel is and that they are indeed believers of the gospel. So he reminds them of the gospel in the opening words here in the opening chapter. This is a a good course of of practice. It, It was good for him to remind them and it's good for us to be reminded as well. I think as we consider the opening chapter, we have to keep in mind what the gospel is and ask ourselves, do we believe it? In fact, I think that's a good and regular practice as a Christian, reminding yourself of what the gospel is, rehearsing the gospel again and again in your mind, so that you remind yourself of what it is and you evaluate your situation in life. Do you still believe? And if you believe, are you enjoying the benefits of the gospel? Is Christ sufficient for you in all matters of life? Martin Lloyd-Jones noted on this text, he said, we want to make quite sure that we are believers of the gospel, that we are enjoying its benefits, because there is, a, there is the danger of assuming that we are Christian only to find in times of need that we are not Christians at all, and therefore that it does not help us. There are many, many in that position. What he is saying is, listen, there are many, many in the position of believing themselves to be a Christian. And then in the moments of difficulty and struggle and trial, they find that they don't fully believe, that they aren't enjoying the benefits of the gospel. And that is because regardless of what they think, indeed they aren't Christians. That's the real danger here. That's the real concern that rises, and that's the underlying concern here that Paul has. Because as these outside voices are starting to creep into the church, the question is, those who are in the church and profess to be Christians, are you really a Christian? And how you respond to the voice of God as opposed to the voice 
of those outside will reveal that. Well, my prayer is that as we consider this letter, we will consider the gospel, the sufficiency of Christ Jesus in all matters of life, so that we can sing with the hymn writer, My faith is found a resting place. From guilt my soul is freed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that He died for me. The sufficiency of Christ. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that He died for me. Let's take a look at our text together now and see the sufficiency of Christ who is our hope of glory. I invite you to stand with me, if you're able, for the reading of the Word of God. Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 9 through 14. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Father, we pray that you'd bless your word to us this morning. Again, that you would indeed guide us through it. Allow our hearts and our minds to be exposed to the joy of the gospel and to see the sufficiency of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This passage might well be called the Apostles' Prayer. In fact, that really is what I'm entitling this one and the next sermon to come. It is the Apostles' Prayer. See, after Paul, uh, after his opening expression of thanksgiving, he now is telling the Colossians what it is that he prays for them. First he says, look, I'm thankful. I thank God every time I pray. This is what I thank Him for. And he lists out the characteristics of the gospel that he thanks the Lord that are evident in the lives of the Colossians. And now he's saying, not only that, but when I pray for you, this is how I pray for you. It is interesting when you consider the opening part of his thanksgiving along with the verses we're looking at this morning that detail his prayer, the similarities that are there between them. His thanksgivings from verses 3 to 8 contain phrases like, since the day you heard in verse 6, thank in verse 3, always in verse 3, when we pray for you in verse 3, understood in verse 6, bearing fruit and growing in verse 6. And his prayer of what he is praying for them in our text this morning has similar language. From the day we heard, verse 9, giving thanks, verse 12, not ceased, verse 9, to pray for you, verse 9, knowledge, verses 9 and 10. Similar ideas here. I'm thankful that you've heard. I'm always thanking uh, God for you. I'm, I'm praying for you often that you would understand, that you would bear fruit. These are our themes of both thanksgiving and prayer requests, which is an interesting thought because what Paul is doing is saying, these are the greatest things that I know about you as believers. You love God, and I'm so thankful for them. You love, it's evident because you love one another. Your hope is in Christ Jesus. This is what I'm praying for you, that you would continue to love God above all things, that He would be the anchor of your hope, and that it would be demonstrated by the way you love one another as you increase and bear fruit and grow. So the very things he's thankful for are the very things he is praying for. This is confirmation that Paul believed the church was on the right track, but in danger of going off the rails, to, to, to phrase it. Going off the rails is a phrase that I learned in South Africa, and it, it describes a life that has been... In, 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 that has come to a train smash, as they would say, or we might say a train wreck. They've gone off the rails, they're traveling along just as you're supposed to be on the train tracks, and something happens that causes the train to go off the rails. 
So when someone left the path of truth and righteousness, you would say he went off the rails. We might say he made shipwreck of his life. It's, it's a great picture here because trains are only meant to run on rails. They don't do well running down an asphalt road or in the mud or on a dirt road. They certainly don't float very well. They're intended to be on the rails. And when they jump the track, there is always a crash. There's always a disaster. Well, the Christian life is meant to be on the rails of righteousness. And we're not meant to veer off. That's the path we're to be on. Those are the tracks that we're to follow. And when we jump off of them, there's a train smash, a train wreck. As Paul is giving thanks, he gives thanks for the path that the Colossian church is on, and he is praying that they would stay on that path. It's always encouraging to know that someone is praying for you and to know what they are praying about. Here Paul gives us the specifics of what he is praying about and it does give us insight into the potential dangers that were barking at the door of the church. Since Epaphras, the pastor of the Colossian church, had come to Paul and Timothy, they had not stopped praying for the believers in Colossae. That's what he says. They haven't ceased to pray for them. Now that doesn't mean that the moment he heard he started praying and, and, and literally did not breathe any other word other than a word of prayer, non-stop. Obviously, that can't be true because he wrote the, the letter, and I'm sure he was able to multitask a lot of things, but you can't write a letter of this detail along with praying at the same time. I think what it means is that it, he, is, he, he has not stopped the normal, regular habit of praying for them. Essentially, what he is saying is, look, since I've heard of it, I've added you guys to my regular prayer list, and I consistently pray for you, whether that's daily, multi-times in a day, weekly, whatever his regiment was, he added the Colossians to it. He said, I'm going to pray for them. And so since I heard of you, I have not stopped praying for you. You are a regular part of my prayer time. And here are the things that he was praying for, two specific things that are, are really one in, in this text. There are two sides of the same coin. He was praying for them with regards to a life that is saturated and a life that shows it, what it is and what it demonstrates. Now, trying to break this passage apart can be a little bit tricky because in the original Greek, verses 9 through 14 are one sentence. One Long, complicated sentence. Paul liked his long sentences. He has many run-on sentences throughout the, the New Testament in his writings, and this is one of those. My English teacher would not have been happy with the Apostle Paul, but who's going to argue with him? He's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this is one long sentence that we have to try and find areas to pull it apart so that we can absorb everything that is in there. So we're going to do our best to understand what Paul is praying about. This morning we're going to focus our time on the front side of that coin, and then the next time we look at this text we'll flip it over and see the back side of the coin. So we're going to start this morning by looking at a life that is saturated. Verse 9, he writes and says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. Now this may seem like two different requests here, but in reality it is one request with two linked parts here, two parts that flow uh, in, in, in the order that they are listed, and this is where the heresies begin to get things wrong. There are many professing Christians who get things wrong, which is why Paul lists them the way that he does. We want to build lives of works oriented in hopes that we'll somehow reach this higher knowledge. But Paul is putting it in the correct order. He prays that the reader would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. The first step in a righteous life is not putting on external behaviors and duties. The cults along the way were crying out, you must do this. You need to add to 
In order to really be spiritual, you have to do this and that and deny yourself of this or that. Paul is saying, no, the first step is to be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. To be filled with something is to be completely controlled by whatever is filling you. We might, be, uh, we might describe a terrified person as being filled with fear because the fear is what is controlling them. Or new parents, we might say they're filled with joy because as they hold the baby, there's joy. In fact, as the mother walks into the labor room, you might say she is filled with fear. And after she delivers the baby, she is filled with joy. The indication is that they are under the control of fear or joy. Well, this is how the word is used throughout the New Testament. It's used to describe what is controlling an individual in the moment. The disciples were filled with sorrow in John 16, 6 when Jesus told them of His departure. The crowd that was gathered around was filled with awe after they saw Jesus heal a man in Luke 5, 26. In fact, it says that the, the amazement seized all of them. So they were filled with awe. They were seized by it, grabbed a hold of and controlled by the awe. And just one chapter later in Luke 6, 11, the Pharisees and the scribes were filled with fury when Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Anger that controlled everything that they were doing in the moment. And in Acts 4.31, the disciples are described as being filled with the Holy Spirit under the control of the Spirit. On that note, Paul Paul, uh, also used the same kind of language when he wrote to the church at Ephesus. He said in Ephesians 5.18, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. The implication is to be under the control, that you are under the control of whatever is filling you. Sorrow, awe, fury, or the Holy Spirit, as is the illustration in Ephesians. Now the illustration of Ephesians is a very practical one that we can easily see because we understand what it is to be filled with wine to the point of drunkenness. Now the passage is not prohibiting the use of alcohol. You won't find that in Scripture. But you will find a prohibition of drunkenness. Not to be under the control of it to where where we would say, that's the alcohol doing the talking. That's the alcohol that's caused them to be so violent. We understand what it's like when someone is so drunk that the alcohol is dictating what they do and say. And they're acting in ways they wouldn't normally act. Paul is using that as a very picturesque illustration to say, you know what that looks like? That's how you're to be under the Holy Spirit. Not in some bizarre, charismatic, wonked out way. Meaning that the Holy Spirit is what controls and dictates what you do and say. How you walk and how you live, the decisions you choose to make. The filling force, in other words, has so saturated the individual that it has complete control. Or in the case of the Spirit, who is not a force but a person, God of very God, being filled with the Holy Spirit is to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Under His leading and His direction. This is the word that Paul is using to pray for his readers here, this word filled He's praying that they would be so filled or maybe a better understanding for us is so saturated. Because a lot of times when we think of filled, we think of a glass that's full to the top and maybe full even to the point of overflowing, but rather think of a sponge that's just so saturated you can't pick it up without the water leaking out of it. This is what we are to be so filled, so saturated with the knowledge of the will of God that it will control us that it will shape the way that we live. This is what Paul is talking about. He wants them to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. Now, what is this will that Paul is talking about here? Again, in verse 9, And so 
from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Praying that you'd be filled with the knowledge of His will. Anytime we talk about the will of God, Christians are prone to begin to think personally about it. In other words, what is the will of God for my life? That question has come up a lot in my ministry years. People constantly asking. Used to be as a missionary, when I would travel around, people would ask me about that. Well, how did you know what the will of God was for your life? How did you know it was the will of God to go to Africa? And when I left, how did you know it was the will of God to leave Africa? Everybody is asking because they want to know how to discern what the will of God is for their life. What decisions we should make, what choices we should choose. Well, I'll tell you this, 90% of the will of God is found in the Word of God. So you obey the Word of God and then do whatever you want. That's my advice when somebody asks me, how do I discern what the will of God is? Are you obeying the Word of God? Yes. Then do what you want. Do what you want. You can be confident that God will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37, 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. Be saturated in the Word of God. And if you are, then do what you want. Why? Because you're going to want to do what God wants you to do. He's going to put the desire in your heart. I, I, I think that statement is twofold, that he gives you the desire of your heart. One, I think it's as a good and loving father who gives good gifts, he gives you what your heart desires. And if you're saturated in the Word of God, your heart's only going to desire things that are good. Secondly, I also read it in the fact that he is placing that desire in your heart so that you long for it. Because that's the direction He wants you to go. So as you sit there and you're weighing two different choices and both of them are good, and you're walking with the Lord in a right standing with Him and saturated in the Word of God, then my advice is, do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. That's a side note, because that's not actually what this passage is talking about. But that's where we always want to run to. What Paul is talking about here is not the personal will of God for your life. Rather, his prayer is that we would grasp the greater will of God. That we would have a fuller understanding of the revelation of Jesus Christ and all that it means for the universe and for the Christian. In other words, the will of God for the redemption of His creation and specifically His children. Paul's saying, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will of redemption. Both over the universe and over His children. We're going to see that unpacked in the rest of chapter 1. We'll see in those verses how Jesus reconciles all things to God and reconciles the children of God to Himself all of creation and the children of God, that it is Christ Jesus who reconciles them. Well, here, Paul is praying that the Colossians would be filled or saturated with the knowledge of His will to reconcile His creation, that they would have an understanding of His gospel plan that is laid out in the pages of Scripture, and that it would control their lives. Here, he combines this knowledge with wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding are two words that appear together often in Scripture. In fact, if you read through the wisdom literature, you'll find them again and again coming together. Wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding. They imply that knowledge has an effect on the recipient. So when you have knowledge and you gain wisdom and understanding, what it is saying is that that knowledge has not just been added to you, but it's actually changed you. It's had an effect on you. It's reached home and it's changed your behavior and your decisions. So here Paul is praying for spiritual wisdom and understanding that would point to the supernatural application of the knowledge of God's will that is only available to Christians. 
those who are in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. His prayer is that this knowledge of God's will for the redemption of man and creation would saturate their lives and change the way they live. See, one of the outside voices that was barking at the door of the Colossian church was the idea of Gnosticism, or at least the beginning inklings of Gnosticism. The idea that you acquire knowledge for the sake of knowledge and that you separate the spirit from the physical. The physical is bad and the spiritual is good, and by doing so you can reach a higher plane. They would also later on believe that, uh, that Jesus was just a man until he was baptized, and then he became the Christ. And that was added to him, and he became at some, some higher level, which, by the way, is completely contrary to Scripture, because we're told at the very beginning, he is Emmanuel, God with us, at the incarnation, at the beginning of the Gospels. But this idea of Gnosticism wanted to separate the physical from the spiritual, and they would say you acquire knowledge to gain knowledge, to know more. There's a, a higher life argument that is raised out of academia, and it's a, a life that knows but is not affected or changed by the knowledge. There is no transformation. Paul is praying for a knowledge that is linked with wisdom and understanding and that would lead to a transformed life. Specifically, one that will cause you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, as verse 10 says. Paul, in verse 10, is using an old idiom of the day that pictures a person's lifestyle as a road that he travels on. That was a common idiom of the day. It's a common idiom of, of, uh, in, in the Jewish culture. It's a common idiom through Scripture. And it's a common idiom in our day and age. We often talk about life as a journey. Life is a path. Life is a trail. Life is a road that you walk on. In fact, the, the poet Robert Frost did this in his poem, The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And I'm sorry, I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood and looked down as far, looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. I'm not going to read the whole poem, but this is how it ends. He says, I shall, I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I chose the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Life, we say, is a journey with many forks in the road. And the path that we choose makes a difference. Certainly, this is true of the Proverbs illustration. The book of Proverbs is part of the wisdom literature. In Proverbs chapter 2, Solomon is writing and giving fatherly wisdom to his son. Wisdom and instruction. And he warns him to stay away from the paths and the ways of evil and to stay on the path of righteousness. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Don't veer off down this dangerous path or that dangerous path that leads to wickedness and evil, but stay on the path of righteousness. Well, this is what Paul is praying. That their lives would be so saturated by the knowledge of the gospel plan of God and governed by the wisdom of the scriptures that they would live lives that are pleasing to God. What is a life that is pleasing to God? In short, it is a life of obedience. You may recall the words of the Father when the Son entered the waters of baptism with John the Baptist. This was the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. There had been no words from Him since He was a 12-year-old boy and had left the temple when His parents were looking for Him. And He said, well, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? And then there's silence from that until now where He is a 30-ish-year-old man. And He shows up where John the Baptist is baptizing in the River Jordan. Matthew records the events in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. After he is baptized and comes up out of the water, it says, And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Well pleased. Do you want to know what a life that is pleasing to God is? 
a life of obedience, the life of Christ. What was so pleasing to the Father about this event? It was the Son's obedience to fulfill all righteousness. Just a refresher on the baptism of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is there. He's the forerunner calling, saying, make straight the way of the Lord. Repent and believe. And he was calling people to repent of their sins and prepare for the coming of the Messiah. And so people were coming and confessing their sin and entering the waters of baptism in a, in a picture of repentance, waiting for the Messiah to come. When Jesus shows up and John sees him coming, he points and declares and said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was really then puzzling to John when Jesus would come and ask him for baptism. In fact, John initially resists because he knows that his baptism is about repenting of sin and he's very well aware that Jesus is the Messiah, the very living God who has no sin. He's the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sin of the world. How can he come to a baptism of repentance for sinners when he is not a sinner? But in order for Jesus to represent sinful man, he had to be numbered with them. So he entered the waters of repentance as a sinner would and pictured his death, his burial, and his resurrection. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he, that is God, made him, that is Jesus, to be sin." He made Him to be sin, Him who knew no sin, to be sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. He had to be numbered as a sinner. So as He stepped into the baptismal waters, it was a step of obedience that pleased the Father. And So as He rose up, the voice came from, came from heaven above, This is My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, because the Son obeyed the Father in everything. Paul is praying that the Colossians would walk in a manner that is pleasing to God. That is, that they would live lives of obedience. He also calls it a manner worthy of the Lord. That is, worthy of being called by His name. There is much in a name. We value that still today. We want our our children to live lives that would bring honor to our family name and not dishonor. You might remind them of the name that they bear behind their first name. Tell my sons, you are reeds. Remember that? Walk worthy of it. I don't know what worth there is in being a reed, but I still want it to sound like it's important, right? I mean, we, we want our names to be upheld. And we want them to understand that if you sully your name, you're sullying my name too. Your actions affect how all of the family is viewed. We also use this kind of language in regards to titles that are given. We might watch a play or a a drama that's put on and, and really poorly done. And when you're finished, you walk out and you turn to your, your spouse and you say, Well, there wasn't an actor worthy of the name in that play. There wasn't anybody in there that was worthy of being called an actor because they were so bad. Or in a positive light, you might say, any doctor worth his name would help an injured man in the street regardless of who he is. Because that's what doctors are supposed to do. They're supposed to help. In fact, they've taken an oath to help and to save lives. So any doctor worthy of his name is going to help an injured person regardless of who they are. There is a way that you live that brings honor to the name or the title that you bear. As Christians, we bear the title of God's children and the name of our Lord, for we are Christians. Therefore, we are to live and to walk in a manner that upholds the great name that we have been given. Friends, this means that we are to live obedient lives. We are 
to walk the road of righteousness and stay away from the paths of evil. As I begin to close this morning, I want to draw your attention to the words of wisdom from Proverbs chapter 2. And I'm going to read the first 12 verses of Proverbs 2. You can turn there if you like. I'll wait just a moment. If you want to follow along, it is a little bit lengthy. But I think it gives us a picture of this path that we're to be walking on, the path of righteousness, staying away from the path of evil. And it is the wisdom of a father to his son. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of His saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you, and understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil. This is what the Spirit of the living God does. This is what a saturated life in the knowledge of the will of God does. It sets up the path before you, the path of righteousness, the path of obedience, and says, this is the way, walk ye in it. And guard you from veering off. This is wisdom. This is a worthy walk. It comes only from being saturated in the gospel. Growing in understanding as you soak up the wisdom of God. Paul is praying that his readers would be saturated in the word. And and this is the only way to keep your life from going off the rails. And if your life is already off the rails, and you say, well, it's too late for that. I'm already off the rails. It's been a train smash, a catastrophe, all kinds of explosions and wrecks, and there I am rolled up. You can get back on the rails. This is the only way. A life saturated in knowledge of the will of God, the gospel of God, understanding it, embracing it, and believing it, this will put you back on the rails. Truly, the word of God is the way of righteousness, and knowledge of the gospel are the rails that keep you on the way. Understanding the gospel, that's what holds you on it. When everything from the world is hurled, and every temptation is there to veer to the evil way, Veer to the way of destruction, and the gospel holds you on. The way of righteousness is the road less traveled by. And to apply Frost in his closing line, that has made all the difference. The gospel is the road that is less traveled. You will look strange in the world on that road a life of obedience to the Word of God. It will look foolish to the world. It is the road less traveled by, but it makes all the difference because eternal life is at stake. May God incline our hearts to His Word that we may walk in a manner worthy of His great name. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Father, that your spirit gives understanding of your scriptures, wisdom and knowledge of the gospel, of your plan to redeem sinners like us. Now, Father, I pray you would take your word and engraft it in our hearts and that you would indeed change our lives, that we might be obedient and walk on the path of righteousness and live lives that are pleasing to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.